Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank our generous sponsor, Lando Lakes, for hosting this presentation and culinary demo on sensory evolution of flavor and taste, and to introduce you to Chef Josh Diekman. Hey everyone, Josh Diekman here with Lando Lakes. Thank you so much for coming to this session today. I'm very excited to be here and it should be a good one because we're talking about flavor and taste and more importantly, how to enhance flavor and plant forward dishes. So again, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be at our expo booth later and uh, we got some other fun stuff that's going on today at our booth as well. So uh, with that being said, let's just jump right in. Uh, so when you think about flavor and taste and how flavor has evolved and how we've evolved, uh, you think of something like this, right? You have your sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Now, we were given our sense of taste, just like all of our other senses, as a guide for early human survival. So, uh, bitter, for example, to keep us away from poison, poisonous berries and poisonous uh, leaves and plants and things like that. Sour, same thing, uh, but also maybe keep us away from spoiled foods and, and things like that. Salt is interesting because our bodies perceive salt as a mineral and we need minerals to survive. We need essential minerals in our diet in order to survive. So these are some of the reasons why we perceive taste. Uh, now, when it comes to umami, umami is very interesting because we associate umami with glutamates in food, amongst other things, but basically it's glutamates in food. The more higher levels of glutamates in food, the higher that umami flavor we're going to get, that, that uh, savory notes, that, that mouth-water and craveability that comes from our dishes, uh, comes from umami and in turn glutamates. Uh, now, the, the highest form of glutamates found in nature uh, is in actually human breast milk. And it's actually 10 times higher in breast milk than it is in cow's milk, for example. So we were pre-programmed, our brains and bodies are pre-programmed to crave glutamates, and in turn crave breast milk, to help ensure that, that the child uh, goes back and, and has and, and eats. So again, just like all of our other senses, uh, our sense of taste really comes down to as a guide for early human survival. Now, the glutamates with, with the child and in the breast milk kind of carries over into adulthood. So this is part of the reason why that dishes with like that have been aged or have high glutamates in it or really have those umami notes really stick out to us and really make it craveable for us. So using those types of ingredients in your cooking really pays off. Now, that being said, those are the five senses, but there's a new sense that I've been hearing a lot about lately, and it's called kukumi. Now, some people are calling kukumi the sixth sense of taste, but you actually don't taste kukumi. So what kukumi actually is, uh, it's a relatively new Japanese taste concept that has to do with mouthfeel. And it has a lot to do with calcium receptors on your tongue and how you're perceiving food. But basically what it does is it provides that mouth, that mouth feel of like some little bit of fattiness and richness to your dishes. So why that's important is because you can use kukumi based ingredients or, or ingredients that have lots of kukumi elements in your dishes. And what it's going to do uh, is it's really going to provide that richness and fattiness to it. So if you're working with plant forward dishes and you're not using a lot of rich type foods, adding ingredients that has that kukumi in it can really elevate your dish. Um, so even though you can't really taste kukumi, it still plays a very important role in flavor. Uh, because what kukumi actually does is it, when it reacts to with the calcium receptors, it actually enhances all the other senses of flavor, of taste. So for example, if you're adding kukumi into your dishes, your, your, your sweetness is going to be sweeter. Your saltiness is going to be a little salty. Uh, all the flavors are just going to enhance and kind of bloom, if you will. So what this means is you can actually use less salt or less sugar in your, in your food, uh, make it a little bit healthier, but not lose any of the flavor or, or the mouthfeel that you're going to get by using kukumi type ingredients. 
Uh, so there's a lot of science around this, but if you are interested uh, in learning more about this, we do do a full uh, sensory of taste class that we offer at Land of Lakes. Uh, feel free, our email address will be up later in the video. We'll also again be at our expo booth and we can talk about it, but we offer a, a class that really goes over to our, how our senses evolved over time because there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on with that. Um, so back to Kukumi. So foods that have the kukumi, what it actually is it, right? So again, there's a lot of science that goes with it, but basically what's been discovered is that foods with high levels of glutathione in it really help produce that kukumi uh, elements to, to your food. So think about it, glutathione is kukumi as maybe glutamates are to umami. Um, in a basic nutshell, uh, but the foods with high levels of glutathione include things like asparagus, avocado, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, spinach, broccoli, garlic, chives, tomatoes, cucumbers, almonds, and walnuts. And there's, there's, there's also a ton more of those type of really nice plant-based uh, uh, ingredients. Um, there's also a substance that has been found in the glutamate family called this. Um, and what this is, is a, a tripeptide structurally similar to glutathione, uh, it's, but it's the most potent kukumi compound known. It's got a sensory activity 12.8 times stronger than glutathione by itself. Uh, so foods containing this, this powerful kukumi substance, are, they're still constantly being discovered, uh, but they're things like fish sauce, yeast, soy sauce, shrimp paste, cheese, and beer. So there's a lot of things that, that are still being discovered with this, but what this is telling us is that foods that have been fermented uh, uh, through fermentation or, or aged really pick up those kukumi elements to them. Uh, so if you think about it, if you think garlic already has a lot of like the glutathione in it, it's already giving you that kukumi, but a black garlic, for example, that's been fermented is really gonna go off the charts with that kukumi uh, flavor and those kukumi compounds. So again, uh, there's a lot that goes into this, but I just wanted to give you kind of a base run and, and let you know why I'm using some of the ingredients that I'm using when we start cooking here in just a minute. Again, if you are interested, please reach out. Love to talk about this stuff, uh, myself or anybody on our team. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and, and, and start looking at what we're gonna be cooking with today. Okay, so let's talk about some ingredients that can really give us that uh, kukumi flavor and sensation. Um, of course, yeast, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, I'm, this is nutritional yeast. Now, if you ever use nutritional yeast before, uh, it's a very popular uh, ingredient in a lot of vegan and, and plant-based cooking because it really provides that little more richness, a little more mouthfeel, the nuttiness and things that you're, you might be missing from some other ingredients. Adding the nutritional yeast in really brings out those flavors. So if you ever used it before, you can kind of get a better understanding as to what we're, what we're accomplishing here by using some of these ingredients. Um, another ingredient that I'll be using today uh, is black garlic. Now, uh, I mentioned this a little bit, but black garlic is one of my new favorite ingredients. Um, it really provides a really nice richness um, and flavor, gives a little nice color to your dishes, and uh, it's a fantastic product, one of my new favorite ones. Uh, also, I've been using uh, brewer's yeast more and more. Now, I mentioned beer has those kukumi elements to it, but it's been fermented as well. But the yeast itself actually has a lot of different flavors. And when I've been experimenting with it, it does bring out more flavors. So we'll be using it to make a pot pie crust today, and we're gonna be not using any salt in that dish uh, because of uh, this is really gonna make that crust stick out with just using the brewer's yeast. So really kind of a fun one. Uh, another one we'll be using is uh, kashimbushi or uh, bonito flakes, which is a fermented dried fish. Uh, this really brings out a lot of flavor. Uh, we'll be making a dashi, we'll be making with some kombu uh, elements to really kind of bring out the umami, um, and the umami and kokumi flavors all together and meld really well together. Um, and of course, cheese, uh, right? So um, using the Land Lakes cheese products here. Now, uh, cheese obviously gives you that kukumi sensation. So using these ingredients and, and cheeses to really accumulate that, 
that mouthfeel that you might be getting plays a really important part in plant forward food because you are getting a lot of those extra flavors come out but you're adding just a little bit of it. Uh, so we'll be using the Land of Lakes uh, extra melt products today and um, let's get cooking. Okay, for our first recipe today, we're gonna to be doing black garlic and wild mushroom pot pie with a whole wheat and brewer's yeast crust. Now we're gonna start with one and a quarter cup of whole wheat flour. We're gonna add a tablespoon of brewer's yeast and we're gonna pulse in a half a cup of Land O'Lakes unsalted butter. Now make sure your butter is cold for that nice flaky crust. Once everything's pulsed, what you're looking for is a nice crumbly looking uh, flour mixture. Transfer to a bowl and then we're going to be adding a quarter cup of cold water, about a tablespoon at a time. And you're gonna to wanna to mix it in until all the water is incorporated in the flour mixture. Once it's all in, use your hands and kind of knead this into a dough ball. And once you get your dough ball, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to wrap this in plastic for at least a couple hours in the refrigerator to overnight. Now for the pot pie filling, what we're gonna be using is we're gonna be starting with a quarter cup of Land O'Lakes unsalted butter uh, mixed with a quarter cup of olive oil. And we're gonna melt this together uh, until a nice uh, uh, small simmer starts to happen. Okay, once everything is melted and it starts to, for a little swimmer, we're gonna add two cups of medium diced golden potatoes. Uh, to that, we're gonna be adding a half a cup of uh, diced shallots. And then we're gonna be adding two bulbs of black garlic. Now the black garlic is kind of hard to cut. It's kind of like cutting tar, but the flavor and texture you get from this dish uh, really makes it worth it. From there, we're gonna be adding two cups of fennel bulb, roughly chopped and two tablespoons of chopped sage. Once you get it all in, you're gonna to want to cover it and you're gonna cook it for about five minutes. After five minutes, go ahead and give it a stir. And we're gonna be adding one pound of assorted mushrooms. I'm using cremini, shiitake, and oyster mushrooms. Make sure you get it all nice and stirred, all that oil and butter mixture going all over. Cover, cook for another five minutes. After five minutes, go ahead and give it another stir. Make sure it's all cooking evenly and you're gonna cover and then cook for an additional five minutes. Once that's done, what we're gonna do is we're gonna deglaze the pan. We're gonna use a quarter cup of vegetable stock with a quarter cup of sherry and we're gonna kind of mix it all together, make sure we get all that nice fawn from the bottom to get all those flavors really nice and incorporated. You're gonna to wanna to simmer this for about three to five minutes or until all the moisture, uh, it kinda of comes out of the dish. So once all the moisture is out, uh, we're ready to go ahead and add our cheese sauce. Now I'm using the Land of Lakes Extra Melt Monterey Jack Cheese Sauce. We're putting two cups into our pot pie filling. And this is what's really gonna give us, of course, that creaminess, that mouthfeel, but it's also gonna be bringing out all the other flavors into this dish for a really nice umami, kokumi experience. Once that's all mixed in really well, you can simmer it for another couple of minutes. And then we need to let this cool. So I'm putting it in a two inch half pan uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and let this cool down to room temperature or you can put it in the refrigerator once it's cool and use it whenever you're ready. Now while that's cooling, we go ahead and get our pot pie crust ready. Now you can shape this to any vessel that you'll be using. I'll be using a 10 and a quarter inch lodge cast iron uh, and I'm kind of doing a rustic cut. Uh, you can be as neat as you want with this. I kind of like the rustic look to this, so I'm just kind of cutting roughly around the edges. Gonna place our pan in uh, a baking sheet just in case any overflow and we'll go ahead and fill it up. Now again, this recipe fits this pan perfectly, but use any vessel that you'd like. We're gonna cover this with our whole wheat and brewer's yeast crust and crimp the edges around. I like to go it around because it helps keep some of that moisture in. We're gonna go ahead and brush it with a whisk egg. 
and we're gonna slit a hole right on top to kind of let some of that moisture release out. From here, we're gonna bake in a 400 degree oven for 30 minutes or until the crust is golden brown. And there's our pot pie. Okay, for our next recipe, we're gonna be doing a grain bowl with a dashi cheese sauce. Now for this, you can use the white or yellow Land O'Lakes Extra Melt sauce. Uh, we're gonna be starting with making our dashi concentrates. We're doing a quarter ounce of kombu seaweed with one cup of water, and we're just gonna let that soak for 30 minutes. No heat whatsoever, just let it soak for 30 minutes. Once it's soaked for 30 minutes, we're gonna simmer on medium heat for about 10 minutes, just to really kind of release all those flavors. From there, we're going to go ahead and strain out that kombu water, uh, trying to get as much of the water from the seaweed as you can. Okay, it's going back into the pot and we're gonna put this back up to a simmer. We're gonna be adding our uh, kasubushi, uh, about one cup, and we're also gonna be adding a quarter cup of water to this. Now, the kasubushi is going to really soak up a lot of that water, so we're gonna add a little more here and we're gonna cook this for another about eight minutes. Now, as I mentioned, the, it really soaks up a lot of that water, so you're gonna really wanna kind of press this and get as much water as you possibly can from this. When it's all said and done, you should end up with a quarter cup of this concentrated dashi. Okay, so we're using the one cup Lana Lakes Extra Melt. Again, you can use yellow if you'd like. I'm using white here. Uh, we're gonna kind of heat this one cup of Lana Lakes Extra Melt cheese sauce and we're gonna be adding our quarter cup of dashi concentrate, mixing it very well, uh, and we're gonna let it simmer once it's mixed for another minute or two. Okay, I let it cool and I'm gonna be transferring into a squeeze bottle for service. All right, so now for our grain bowls, uh, what we'll be using is we've got six cups of cooked farro, a half a cup of edamame, a half a cup of black beans, one cup of roasted broccoli, one cup of roasted carrots, and one cup of roasted kale with one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. Now I'm serving this as a cold grain bowl, but of course this works great as a hot bowl. Just make sure all of your ingredients are hot, including your dashi cheese sauce. To assemble the bowl, we're just gonna simply mix all these ingredients together until they're all mixed evenly. Okay, for service I have some fine diced fresh kale and then I have our dashi cheese sauce. I'm gonna take our grain bowl and I'm just gonna put this dashi cheese sauce right on top as a dressing. The flavor of the dashi cheese sauce really brings out all the other components of this dish. We're gonna garnish it with our chopped kale. And there is our dashi cheese grain bowl. Thank you everyone for attending this session today. We really appreciate it. We hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions or comments, please stop by our expo booth later today. We're also gonna be featuring two more recipes featuring kokumi and umami, including a miso mac and cheese, as well as a black garlic mushroom ravioli. Thank you so much again. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.